In the days when judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, so a man from Bethlehem and Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech, and his wife's name was Naomi. The names of their two sons was Malon and Kilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem, Judah. They went to Moab and lived there. Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, and one was named Orpah, and the other Ruth. After they had lived there about ten years, both Malon and Kilian also died, and Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. When Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, she and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. When Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's home. But Ruth replied, Don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. Welcome, Crossbridge. My name is Kevin, and I'm the lead pastor here. And uh, I'm excited to share this story uh, this week with, with you at our campuses, those at, at Morris, at Peru, as well as those online. Uh, I'm thankful that we are one church in a variety of locations. Hey, this story of Ruth is, is a great story. In fact, um, you'll find it kind of tucked away in the Old Testament. And it's not, a, it's not a long story, but there's some really good things in it that, that I look forward to sharing with you today. Let's just, let's just jump, jump right in. You've got Naomi, who um, she is, she's moved from Bethlehem to Moab due to a famine um, that, was, that was going on at that time. Not long after they arrive, a tragedy strikes for her and her husband dies. She, she still has two sons, and, and then 10 years later, a trage- tragedy strikes again, and both sons, who had married, die. And so now what you have left is you have Naomi and you have her two daughter-in-laws. And it's, it's just a, it's a beautiful picture. In fact, um, I shouldn't say that at first. It's a bitter picture at first, but it ends up being beautiful as we continue to work through the story. Uh, Naomi basically says, hey, I'm, I'm going back to Bethlehem. And the daughters-in-law say, we're going with you. What, what you'll see is she begins to try to talk them out of it. In fact, Ruth chapter 1 Verse 13, the second part of it, she says, No, my daughters, it's more bitter for me than you because the Lord's hand has gone out against me. This, this gives us a really good kind of perspective of how Naomi is seeing this. Naomi is seeing this, it's a tragedy of her husband dying as well as her two sons, is that the Lord has done this. That for whatever reason, he has not you know, seen her in favor and uh, has, has put out his hand against her in, in taking basically her family. And, and obviously that has a very deep effect on her. And, and then what you get is, that, is she's telling you know, her daughter-in-laws, hey, don't come. One of them says, yeah, okay, and stays back. But Ruth says, uh-uh, like there is no way I'm staying back. In fact, I am going with you and there's not a thing you can do about it. If you listen to Ruth chapter 1, verse 16, here's what she says. She says, where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. What a, like, picture of faithfulness. When, when I think of this story, I think it's, it's a picture of this faithful kind of living that, uh, truth is, I, I, I think that's a little harder to find in our world today. That, that people who would just choose to do the right thing because it's right, no matter what it costs them. Picture this with me. I mean, Naomi's in a, a really bad place, but the truth is so is Ruth. She's lost her husband as well, and she's willing to leave what she knows to be with Naomi. Um, she's willing to be faithful to walk with her, even when faithful is hard. 
you know, he, here's here's just the facts of the story. The road that Ruth is is taking with Naomi is definitely the road less traveled. In fact, it's guaranteed that life is going to be extremely hard for them, and they will likely live in poverty for the rest of their lives. To make matters worse, um, Ruth is a Moabite. And the Moabites had oppressed the Israelites for 18 years. And in the lower story, there's very little chance she'll be accepted. And yet out of deep love for her mother-in-law, this is the path that she chooses. One of the things I would just remind us is um, doing the right thing is always right. But that doesn't mean that it's easy. Uh, I, I love the heart of Ruth who is just determined to do the right thing no matter how difficult it is. I, uh, it, this story actually, it, it reminds me of my father, if I'm, if I'm just honest, and maybe um, it's coming off of Father's Day that I'm probably a little more tender to it. And um, when I think about my dad growing up, one of the things that I would say, one of his characteristics that, that stuck with me more than anything is it just, when he was presented with the opportunity to, to do the right thing, he always did the right thing. I don't remember a time in my childhood where I watched my dad make a decision that just wasn't the right thing. There were often times when I watched him actually make decisions that were the right thing that had adverse effects on him or our family. Things in which maybe it was a a hard year and we would be struggling like farming, right? And, And other farmers would struggle, but he would choose to give things away. Over and over, I just, I watched his heart and his attitude. I, so many times I would watch him make decisions and when he would shake someone's hand, I would know that was a done deal. Whether it was, ended up being good or something changed to make it bad, right was right. And that's the kind of man he was. Faithful kind of living. Listen to what Nehemiah chapter seven, verse two says. I put in charge of Jerusalem, my brother Hanani, along with Hananiah, the commander of the citadel, because he was a man of integrity and feared God more than most people do. You know, it's this picture, I think, that this is a little more rare um, than, than probably we would like it to be. I think of Proverbs 3, verse 5, that says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. That, that there is this picture that says, I'm going to live for the Lord. I'm going to live according to his word. I'm going to do the things that, that he says bring about right living, whether it feels right in the moment or not. I'm going to trust that his right is right. When Naomi and Ruth, let's just continue through the story, they, they come into Bethlehem and um, they've been gone a little over 10 years. And, and listen to the interaction from these women. In fact, this is, this is a really cool part of the story. Here's what they say. Can this be Naomi? Imagine, imagine them picturing from a distance. She's, she's walking in into town and they're like, is that Naomi? And, and Naomi replied, don't call me Naomi. In fact, here's what she says. Call me Mara because the Almighty has made my life bitter. This is a really, I think, cool, important part of the story. It says, I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. I have, a, I have a feeling that these women who, who see um, Naomi returning probably at that moment are like, oh boy, Naomi's at a really bad place. In fact, um, whew, she's, she's definitely going to need a girl's night out, right? And to talk through some of this. And here's the deal. The word Mara, that name, which she gives herself, it, it means exactly what it says in the scripture. It means bitter. And Truth is, she is. She's convinced that the Lord has orchestrated all that's happened and that she cannot see how God can bring anything good out of the mess that he's given her. How can we relate to this? I see this often. I see people who've been through hard, the hard knocks of life and they've become bitter and they've become hardened. Sometimes they're sitting inside the church. Sometimes they're hiding in the church and they're just not raising their hands that they've been hurt And sometimes they're outside the church. And actually, sometimes my experience has been when those who are outside the church have these bitter kinds of hearts because they've probably assessed their situation to God's heavy hand coming down on them, they're very vocal about who God is and why they don't want anything to do with him. When life turns bad and we pin the responsibility of what we're experiencing on God, life turns bitter quickly. And you know this as well as I do. 
it is so easy for us to go there. There are many times, I think, where our stories have been written and our narratives kind of have been written and we've, we've assigned responsibility. We've, we kind of know how this story has gone for us. And, and I, I know this well, it's, it's hard for us to allow God to rewrite that. God, is, God has to do some deep work in our hearts and we have to be willing to let him write a new story. In fact, um, it's sad when these false narratives, um, when they really settle in and they get deep. In fact, these kinds of stories, these false narratives that we've believed that, that turn us to these bitter places, when we come to the place where something has happened and it doesn't match up with God and we blame him, that story becomes written on, on a stone tablet that is so hard for us to erase. But I believe this, if, if we can't get to the place where we allow God to take these, these bitter, bad, hard stories and, and see his goodness in them and see him walk us through on the other side, we're always going to miss out on what he's designed for us, his best for us as his children. Let's jump back in the story. Now, Naomi still um, owns the land that her husbands and sons once farmed. It's kind of interesting, right? She's been gone for over 10 years, but she still owns that land. However, Naomi, she, she can't manage this property by herself. And, and as I was doing some reading, what it was basically told in context of, of that history, in context of her being a woman, in context of her not being able to take care of it, she would have been forced to sell it. When she sells it and the money is gone, she'll be stuck in poverty for the rest of her life. So let me explain just a little further. The issue is the identity of a family was tied to land ownership. And once it was sold, it, was, it would be as if her husband never existed. So how will two poor single ladies make it in Bethlehem? The Old Testament, there was this provision for um, widows, for, for people just like these ladies. Uh, the provision was that they could glean. It was called gleaning. And um, here's what it meant. Those who owned the land would send out the harvesters to the field and they would harvest the crop. Whatever little was left, they would leave for the poor to glean. This is Ruth's primary way of showing hope and help to her aging mother-in-law. She goes out and she's, she's gleaning. She's picking up what's left. She's gathering the leftovers and she's bringing that home in hopes to have enough to live off of. Ruth randomly picks a field. Listen to this story. I say randomly, but God is at work in this. Ruth randomly picks a field and, and she gleans it and um, the owner shows her favor. In fact, she's shocked that the owner accepts her and uh, here is her response. Ruth chapter 2 verses 10 through 12. Here's what she says. Why have I found such favor in your eyes that you notice me, a foreigner? He replies, I've been told all about you, um, all about what you've done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband. How you left your father and mother and your homeland and came to live with a people you did not know before. May the Lord repay you for what you've done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you've come to take refuge. Just a simple thing that I would notice, uh, say here, is when we do live faithfully and, and when we do the right things because they're right, it sticks out and people notice and, and Boaz, which is, is this individual here in the story, he notices. In fact, um, Ruth runs home with her arms filled with what she has gleaned. And, and she begins to tell Naomi this story. And she tells him, hey, Naomi, this landowner, like he accepted me. And he, and he told me that he knew about me and he knew where I came from. And, and it was interesting. She says, his name is Boaz. The moment she says that, Naomi, I can picture this, Naomi's mouth drops. And, and a little light bulb goes on. See, Boaz is a relative of Naomi. This is a huge deal. There's a concept in the law that if a man dies and fails to leave behind a son, the next of kin has the option to marry the widow, to love her, to take care of her, and to pay off the financial debts and redeem the land. Here's what that person is called. The man is called the kinsman redeemer. You want to look that up on your own? The kinsman redeemer. Really cool concept. So here's what, here's what um, 
picture this, right? Uh, when, they have a, when they have a child, he is to deed the land to the heir in the name of the deceased husband, thus allowing the husband's name, the deceased, to live on. The kinsman redeemer takes on a huge risk without adding a penny to his name. What a beautiful picture. So Naomi hasn't been this hopeful in a long time. And so she takes on the role of um, matchmaker, you know, farmer.com, right, whatever. Uh, And she tells Ruth to clean herself up, to head over to Boaz's house that night to win his heart. Uh, She needed to wait until after he ate, right? She says, hey, wait till after he eats and, and when he goes to bed and then sneak in and uncover his feet and lie down at the foot of his bed. And Boaz would know exactly what she was doing. This was a nonverbal way of requesting marriage. And, and Boaz wakes up startled and he says, who are you? And here's what she says. She says, I'm your servant, Ruth. Spread the corner of your garment over me since you are a kinsman redeemer. Boaz accepts they were married. Um, not only did, did he buy Ruth's deceased husband's land, but all his brother's land as well and their father's as well. And Ruth and Boaz go on to have a, a boy named Obed. He has no idea, but he'll go on to inherit the land and carry on his deceased father's name. All this due to the kind act of Boaz. Now, that was the, that was the, um, I was talking actually to a couple of the pastors at Crossbridge this week. That's probably the G-rated version of that story. If you were to dig in, you would probably see a little more, but we're not going to talk about that today. Um, Now, Here's a really cool piece, right? So you can kind of see this story, how it starts off so bad. And then God begins to like, in his upper story kind of way, he begins to take these characters and he begins to put this story together like only God can do. I love when he does that. And, and here's what we see just a little bit later in the, in the story. Um, the women of the town said to Naomi, listen to Ruth chapter four, verse 14. Praise be to the Lord who this day has not left you without a kinsman redeemer. Praise be to the Lord who this day has not left you without a kinsman redeemer. Now you, you think about it. God has been assessed this bitter kind of story. And now God is being assessed the goodness, this, this beautiful thing that's happening in this story. In the lower story, Naomi thought that her life was over and that God had given up on her. Well, she was wrong. In fact, here's what's really, really interesting. If, if you read the book of, of Ruth, which you're going to read, um, you're going to read this week, right? And you're going to be doing your own kind of study on this story. But she goes from one place where she says, call me Mara, to a little later in the story when all this has been unveiled, she goes back to Naomi. Now, I don't think that's by accident. I don't think she was just Mara, like in this one scene. Here's what I think happened. I think when she entered back into Bethlehem, Mara was very, very fitting because she was bitter. But I think when she discovered, when she discovered this godly perspective of what God was doing in his upper story to come down in her lower story and begin to put these pieces together in and, and this providential kind of care for her and for Ruth, there's no way that this could have been lined up in any other way than God doing it himself, that it changed. It changed her outlook. It took her from bitter from, from a world perspective that said she was bitter to a world perspective that says this is absolutely beautiful. See, the name Naomi, the name Naomi means beautiful. She went from bitter to beautiful. What an incredible, what an incredible story. I, I think for many of us, we can probably relate to that, right? We can probably relate to this idea that maybe, Maybe many of you have something in your story, something that's taken place, maybe something that you've assessed that that God has done this and I am upset with him and, and I am bitter about this. And I think God's hope would be that as you step back, that he would continue to find ways to reveal himself in a way which you would see that God is at work even when it is bitter and doesn't look good. And that God can take this bitter, terrible story and he begin to work in it to bring out something beautiful. In this story, um, it may seem like, you know, it is hopeless. But I, I think as the story progresses, we see hope enter in this huge kind of way. Now, here's, here's the, the piece I want you to see at, at the very end of this story, which I, I think is... Um, the whole time I've been preaching through the Old Testament, here's what I want you to see. I want you to see the story in the Old Testament, but I want, to, I want you to see 
how it connects to the New Testament. I want you to see how these stories in the Old Testament, like that Jesus is still, like there's all these like subtle storylines that point us ahead to who Jesus is. That we see that this, this God is at work in the entire story and it's all tied together. Here's what I want you to notice. At the end of the book of Ruth, we see the gene- genealogy of Boaz's family. Obed grows up. He has a son named Jesse. Jesse grows up. He has a son named David. And 28 generations later, we have a baby born in Bethlehem named Jesus. How cool is that? In fact, Jesus, now here's what I want you to think about. Jesus is the ultimate kinsman redeemer who came from a family of an outsider named Ruth. God was not only working to provide the needs of Ruth in the lower story, he was working out his upper story plan in the revelation of his son as well. Here, here's the thought that I want you to think about when, when you think about kinsman redeemer. One of the things we read about kinsman redeemer, right, is, is someone who takes on all the risk for nothing in return. When you think about what Jesus did for us, you think about what God did for us in sending his son while we wanted nothing to do with him in the midst of our sin and brokenness, he laid down his life for each of us. In fact, 1 John four nineteen says it really, really simple, but hear this, we love because he first loved us. This wasn't about our initiative towards God. This was about his initiative towards us when we wanted nothing with him. I think about the second piece of the kinsman redeemer is this, that he pays off our debt. You, you know, when he, when he went on to, to marry Ruth and he, and he paid off all the debt and he bought the land and he basically secured that for her, right? Um, think about Jesus. Think about Jesus as the one who has paid your debt. I heard of a really cool thing the other day. Um, I was reading some some news and I saw that uh, there was a commencement speech at Morehouse College. Some of you might have heard of this. There was a billionaire investor by the name of Robert Smith um, and, and basically as he was doing the commencement speech for, for Morehouse College, in the middle of his speech he looked out um, across 396 graduating students and here's what he said to them. He said, hey, I want to, I in a sense, this is my paraphrase, but I'm going to give you a shot at life and I'm going to do something for you today that is going to change you and I want you to pass it forward. I am paying off every one of your student debt loan. 396 kids um, threw their hats in the air, not just because they were excited that they graduated. They threw their hats in the air because every one of their student loan debts had been erased at that graduation ceremony. Can you imagine I'm trying to get him to come speak at Crossbridge, but he has not replied yet. I'm just kidding. You know, it's amazing, right? You think about how that would change the course of a student's life. And and yet I think, sure, it changes the course financially of a student's life. But think about what Jesus has done for us. In fact, I love Isaiah 53, and here's what it says. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him him and by his wounds we are healed it's the idea that God sent his son as a sacrificial lamb to take on the debt of our sin to take on the punishment in which we deserved so that every ounce of debt payment that we should have paid in regards to sin he says "Uh uh-uh I am paying it in full for you, that it will change your life, not only here, but it will change your life for an eternity. In fact, that's the final piece of the kinsman redeemer that I just want to point out. See, what Boaz did um, for these two ladies, not only was it going to change their life for like in the moment, not only was it going to change it for the next year, it was going to change it for years to come. That They were going to have a way of making a living, of having, in a sense, an inheritance, something that was coming to them. 1 Peter 1, 3 and 4 says this, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you. You know, here's, here's just the reality. Not all of us will inherit something from our earthly father. 
It'd be great if we did, but not all of us will. But every one of us, because of what God has done for us in sending our kinsman redeemer, have an opportunity to inherit incredible spiritual riches that will last a lifetime. You know, I hope what you hear in this story is this, that every single one of us is in need of the debt of our sin to be paid. Every single one of us is in need that, that God would come along and, and take on the risk and, and love us and, and initiate this relationship with us. And every one of us, there's going to come a point where we leave this world and we go into the next and we're going to need the inheritance that God has promised, the promise of eternal life with Jesus in the world to come. You know, as I think about this message, I think there's a lot of things for a lot of different people. I think maybe there's the call for you just to continue to do what you know is right, like to live faithfully. Uh, maybe as, as you listen to this message, that, that you would recognize um, that maybe you, you've assessed some blame on God that really isn't on him, and you've become bitter, and, and you need him to reveal himself in a way and take what is bitter and make it beautiful. Or maybe... Maybe you're here and you've been investigating a relationship with Jesus. And maybe you would open your heart to allow him to cancel the debt of your sin for the very first time. Whatever it may be, I trust this, that God is here, that he's in our campuses and that he's speaking to you. And my encouragement to you, as your campus pastors prepare to come, my encouragement to you would be listen because this isn't my words that you're hearing. It is the word of the Holy Spirit that is, that is speaking directly to you. I trust it because it happens week after week. And when you're hearing, may you know it is from him. And he wants to do something beautiful in your life.